Okay, I'm now like to welcome Dr. Nancy O'Hara, who's right next to me. <laughs> um, she's going to discuss treating Lyme and your panda's child. My mentor, Dr. Sid Baker, once told me to uh, let people know how you got to where you are today. Um, I uh, started my career teaching kids with autism 30 years ago, and I was a lousy teacher. So I decided to take the easier route and went to medical school. And I uh, was after uh, residency, chief residency fellowship, was a general pediatrician, card carrying, regular practice, and a partner in the practice, and had a lot of kids with autism in my practice because I, I had a natural inclination to working with those families. And it was actually somebody I knew from where I grew up in West Virginia that had a son who was four years old uh, with tremendous allergies, asthma, and uh, autism, severe, uh, nonverbal. Um, went away on vacation, got a diarrheal illness, called our office. The nurse said to take him off milk. Um, she took him off milk and he started talking. And she called me and I said, well, you're on vacation, you're working with him full time, keep doing what you're doing, um, and that's great. She came back, she put him back on milk, he stopped talking. She called me and I said, well, it's a transition, it's the flight, it's all of those things. Um, thankfully for her, uh, she didn't believe me and uh, tried the same thing three or four times and uh, then found my mentor, daughter, Dr. Sidney Baker. And she came to me and she said, look, there's something to this. You've got you've to go see him. And I thought, this is crazy. You know, diet, changes in diet cannot make a difference in autism. But at the time, I was going through infertility. And uh, I thought, well, I could go as a patient. You know, nothing was working. We'd been doing it for four years. And I went to see Sid, and that changed my life. And um, I'm not here to say that diet cures autism. I'm not here to say that anything necessarily cures autism. But um, there are things that I found that you can do that can make a difference. Thankfully, we got pregnant. And uh, fast forward, I started my career in looking at kids with neurodevelopmental problems integratively. And uh, uh, fast forward about uh, 10 years till about four years ago. Um, my son developed uh, severe seizure-like tics, um, out of control, and uh, it was right after a strep infection. And uh, thankfully, um, you know, thanks to Sue's work and others, um, I knew what to do acutely, and within three months, he was back to his old self. But that started me on looking at this, and then. Um, Thanks uh, to all of you for inviting me here. You asked me to talk a little bit about Lyme today, um, because where we live, that's certainly something a lot of us see. And many of you put together some questions uh, that you wanted me to, to try to answer. And so that's what these slides are based on, just the answer to some of those questions that you asked. This is a quote that uh, comes from the president of the Czech Republic um, that Sid gave me years ago. And I think it's very um, pertinent. Follow those who seek the truth, but flee from those who have found it. And whether we're talking about autism or pandas or Lyme, there's a lot of truths that we're still trying to figure out. And I think if anybody says there's no such thing as pandas or there's no such thing as recovering from any of these problems, run the other way. So I'm not going to talk a lot at all about gestational Lyme. Um, there, what I really want to focus on is, is acute Lyme and the autoimmune processes that can occur when we're talking about you know, PANS, PITANS, um, but, but also a little bit about chronic. Many of you asked about testing. Um, Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. No test is necessarily going to tell you yes or, or no, definitely you know, not necessarily no. But um, if you have the clinical symptoms, and we'll go over those in a minute, then we first start with an extended Western blot. And locally, the lab that I think does the best job is clinical lab partners, because they do a much more extensive uh, Western blot with nine bands rather than three that you may find at some of the other labs. Um, we'll do a CD57. We'll also look at other inflammatory and immune markers uh, that you'll see us get. You know, sed rates, CRPs. Sometimes we'll get immunoglobulins. Um, is that this one going? Why don't I take, uh, let me take this one. So 
So anyway, um, and then uh, for our families that can financially afford it, sometimes we'll do an IgenX, again with co-infections, um, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Bartonella. Um, and for those who are uh, uh, antibiotic naive, or have not had antibiotics in about three months, we will sometimes do a culture, although again, a very expensive uh, test to do. But most importantly, in a lot of what we, we do when we look at, um, it's our N of 1. And we have to look at each individual child, and most importantly, look at the history of that child as to whether Lyme is something we should, we should be looking at. And again, with acute Lyme, especially when we talk in this context, we look at a sudden worsening of behaviors. And those behaviors can be any of the things that Peggy talked about, and that we all know are signs of, of PANS or, or PANDAS or PITANS. Um, but in addition, in these kids, we specifically look for the history um, acutely of either a rash, which you'll see um, in as, as many, if you know what you're looking for, is 80% of children. Um, uh, but many rashes are missed. Uh, joint symptoms, flu-like symptoms, malaise. But again, it can just be neurologic or neuropsychiatric in this presentation. Um, and one of the things that I missed, and this is from Horowitz and others, or one of the things that I think is, is missed, is looking at the multi-systemic nature um, of, of this disease. And many of the kids who get um, symptoms related to Lyme uh, have multiple other problems, other infections, um, may well have strep, mycoplasma, uh, viruses, yeast, um, immune dysfunction, either a genetic predisposition or other evidence of inflammatory markers like IL-1, 6, 2, and necrosis factor, allergies, nutritional deficiencies. Some of these kids may be vitamin D deficient, um, deficient in iron, zinc, um, and mitochondrial dysfunction and metabolic uh, disturbances are very common. I think that's one of the things we see, especially in our kids with autism and uh, whether it be Lyme or, or PANDAS, um, those kids have other metabolic, mitochondrial, genetic susceptibilities to autoimmune disease. Um, and Lyme is not autism. Lyme is, I mean, PANDAS is not autism. Autism is not PANDAS, but it's a, you know, a kid that's unlucky enough to get that and another infection, but may well be genetically predisposed. Or secondary to the infections have the metabolic and mitochondrial secondary deficiencies um, that have come about because of the infection. And then a lot of these kids also have GI issues. So um, what, do, what do we talk about? Um, I think first of all we look at antimicrobial treatment. In a lot of these kids, a short course of treatment um, it is not enough. Uh, depending on the study you look at, there's a 25 to 71 percent failure rate. And a short course of treatment is 10 days to, to two weeks. If it's really Lyme, you have a Western blot positive, you have a strong clinical suspicion, you have an EM rash, whatever the, the strong indication is, then the treatment weight may well need to be for three months. And certainly if symptoms resolve, two months symptom free. And that usually falls around, around the same time. Um, we also are, especially if you're looking at chronic Lyme and you're treating for quite a long period of time, many of these kids you need to also look at antifungals um, because they will secondarily get yeast overgrowth from chronic antibiotics. Um, liver protection with milk thistles, some of our colleagues use adaptogens. Um, I also just want to very briefly mention biofilm. I, I think some of these kids with chronic infections, particularly chronic Lyme, have um, what is considered a biofilm disease. When you have chronic um, infections, particularly prosthetic infections, but you can also see this in chronic sinus infections, uh, chronic lung infections, the germ is encased in a biofilm matrix. Biofilm is the normal layer that, that um, encases our nose down to our anus. But with some chronic infections, that biofilm matrix can encase the germ, and that can make it more difficult to treat, more difficult to find, and it's something we have to consider in some of these kids with chronic infections. 
Somebody asked about detoxification. I think there are very natural and easy ways to help our kids to, to clean out their systems, milk thistle being one of them. Sometimes charcoal, and we'll get to that when we talk about Herx reactions. Um, Epsom salts baths. Uh, and certainly in kids that we think are having an inflammatory reaction, we'll give a dose of ibuprofen and see if the symptoms resolve. And that includes the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And if it does, that's further proof that an inflammatory um, process may be going on. In our practice, we try to use a lot of natural immunotherapy um, for these kids because I think that's a very important part of our treatment. And a lot of our kids either don't need to go on to IVIG, can't go on to it, can't get it covered, um, can't do it uh, for a multitude of reasons. And I think it's important to look at all the other natural um, ways that we can help these kids. Diet is certainly very important in my book. In fact, I have several patients that come to me and say, I didn't come for a few years because I heard you were a diet doctor and I couldn't do the diet. Don't, don't not come because you think that, but, but diet is very important. And it's not about GFCF. Um, it's not about all the acronyms of the names, but it's about a diet that is anti-inflammatory. And I'll show you that in a minute. I think probiotics, especially if you're using high doses of antibiotics for whatever microbe you're dealing with, need to be done at a separate time of day of the antimicrobials, but probiotics and sometimes prebiotics, Saccharomyces inulin in some of our kids. Other natural um, uh, immunotherapy includes aloe. Uh, one caveat about aloe, if it tastes good, it's probably not good aloe. Good aloe is uh, certified. So you want to see the certification on it um, because there are a lot of products out there that are really not good products and, and not good aloe tastes like water and that's what it is. Um, curcumin, which is a very good uh, anti-inflammatory, it's the ingredient in the spice turmeric. Um, luteolin, quercetin, resveratrol are also good anti-inflammatories. Reishi mushrooms in kids that are not allergic to mushrooms uh, can be a good natural treatment. And then some herbals can also have uh, anti-inflammatory and immune-modulating properties. So I think these are things to think about in our kids that are especially chronically infected um, with Lyme. And I'm sure this isn't what Emerson meant. Uh, he wasn't talking about the gut uh, or the effects of the gut, but I think what lies within us in our guts is very important to what's going on and what symptoms we're seeing. So the dietary interventions are, are fresh, unprocessed, unrefined, unadulterated food. Real food, non-barcode food. Um, varied and rotational as much as possible, non-allergenic. It doesn't mean you have to go out and get a huge allergy panel to see what your kid is allergic to. If your child is craving something, they may well be sensitive to it. Or if your child has reactions after they eat it, that's a food you may want to remove. Protein is very important, especially in our kids that have neuropsychiatric symptoms, and especially early in the day. Um, high ORAC foods, high antioxidant foods, colored vegetables. The brighter the color, the higher the antioxidant capacity. And organic as much as possible. We now know that all rice, even some organic rice, uh, because of the way it's grown, has arsenic in it. Chicken, non-organic chicken are fed arsenic to, to plump them up. So I think there are certain things, if you can't do everything organically, there used to be the dirty dozen, now it's the, the, the dirty 15. Well, that doesn't sound good, but uh, uh, eating uh, an anti-inflammatory diet as much as possible is important. So some of you asked what's the difference between a flare and a Herx and a die-off reaction. You know, a, a negative reaction when you give an antimicrobial um, usually in Lyme treatment, that's called a Herxheimer's reaction. Often in antifungal treatment, it's called die-off. But it's a worsening of those symptoms you're trying to get better. Um, and that can be a bad good. You know, it's, it's horrible as a parent, but it may well mean that you're hitting on the right thing. You may need to decrease the dose, you may need to change things up a little bit, but it may well be a, a, a good and expected reaction. And a flare, certainly, your child can have whenever they get exposed to a new microbe. They've been treated for their pandas and now they're exposed to Lyme and they get a flare of those symptoms. One of the things that is often missed in kids with Lyme is that there are three ways that Lyme needs to be treated. 
cystic cell wall and intracellularly. Now I'm not talking about the kid that gets a tick and you, you see it, you get um, symptoms or a rash right away. That child probably needs one antibiotic for a period of time. I'm talking about a kid that you really think has chronic Lyme or Lyme inducing a, an autoimmune reaction. You may well need to think about treating all forms of the Lyme, cystic, cell wall, and intracellular. So these are the, the cystic um, antibiotics and natural agent. Grapefruit seed extract has been shown in a few studies to um, do a very good job in, in treating the cystic forms. Intracellularly, these are the antibiotics that are, that are most often used. Um, and cell wall. Uh, I am bicillin is one that is used um, in, by some of my colleagues and we occasionally will use it. With chronic Lyme, it may well need to be as much as two and three times a week. And if you've not had an intramuscular injection of iron bicillin, it is a very, very painful um, injection. Um, but in some of our kids who have very disturbed guts, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune colitis, um, those kids respond much better to intramuscular uh, injections than to oral antibiotics. It's not our preference, though. In, in some of our kids, we will do a herbal protocol because uh, antibiotics, um, particularly when you talk about multiple antibiotics, can be very problematic for a lot of the kids. And, um, you know, we do not do prolonged courses if we're not seeing improvement. The course should not be more than three months if you're not seeing improvement in the symptoms. Um, uh, and, but at times, we will use an herbal protocol. Calden's protocol is the one that is most well researched, um, which is basically Salmento, Banderol, and, and moving on from there. Um, there are several brands of these products. We tend to, to just use Nutramedics products when we do do it. Um, but Banderol, for instance, has very good antimicrobial properties in general. Um, uh, antifungal, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory properties. So together with Salmento can be, if used properly and followed properly, can be a good protocol to consider. So again, we look at Lyme, first of all, when we're talking about it from an autoimmune perspective, at the acute changes which can just be neurologic, but we do look for the flu-like symptoms, the fever, the headache, the joint pains and myalgias, the rashes, um, et cetera. And we certainly look for the co-infections because I think you know, it's not just Borrelia that we're looking at. And some of the co-infections have very distinct um, uh, symptomatology associated with them. For instance, Babesia, an unrelenting headache, um, paresthesias, night sweats, fatigue, um, an unrelenting cough, um, and Babesia, not only to some of the medications, responds well to Artemisia, uh, Cryptolysis, Enula at times, and those are things we, we use. And many of you were asking about herbal formulations, and that's why I put these in also. Bartonella, we see stretch marks in kids that have not had um, weight changes, have not um, had a pregnancy. Um, uh, abdominal pain, sore soles of their feet, um, and cognitive changes. These are kids that definitely can go from A's to C's overnight. Um, and, and seizures. We had one little girl present uh, with seizures with Bartonella. And again, um, Houtonia is an herb that we use, and then the antibiotics. Anaplasma or ehrlichia, uh, headache, myalgias, malaise, um, and we use doxycycline and comunda for that. So I think um, I, a lot of people asked about treatment pitfalls, you know, what if this isn't working? I think there are lots of reasons that that happens. First of all, I think the number one reason is not looking at it as a multi-system problem and not looking at the underlying um, immunologic factors that are going on, the underlying metabolic factors that are going on, the underlying mitochondrial deficiency that may be going on, and all of those are simple blood tests from a regular lab. These are not specialty tests. These are regular lab tests to see if any of these are going on in your individual child, and then treating them if they are. Um, it, the second point is not addressing the immunotherapy. We're just putting the kids on antibiotics. And if we're not addressing the immunology behind it, 
then they're also um, not going to get better. And especially if we're not using probiotics with long-term antibiotics, they're probably going to get worse. Um, and in many of the kids not addressing the yeast, not necessarily as a primary, but after multiple months of antibiotics, many of these children will have yeast overgrowth. And that's something that needs to be looked for and treated. And the signs of yeast overgrowth are kids that have um, inappropriate giggling um, or laughter, tremendous mood swings, um, uh, certainly tinea in any form, you know, ringworm, uh, tinea capitis, vaginal yeast infections. Um, some of these kids will have urinary symptoms, uh, uh, red cheeks, and, and then in, in older children, non-diaper children, we'll see yeast rashes, we'll see diaper rash. So those are things to think about if you see any of those to, to think about antifungal treatment, either naturally, herbally, or, or uh, by medication. I don't tend to use any of the systemic antifungals in those kids because, again, you've got so many antibiotics on board, um, you really have to protect the liver. So nystatin or uh, herbal remedies at times. And then, as I said, not addressing the underlying mitochondrial and metabolic defects that some of these kids will have. Um, especially the kids with cognitive delays, a lot of those kids will have carnitine deficiencies. Um, some of them will have very low homocysteines, and that's something we look at and then treat appropriately. And again, it can be secondary to all the medications or to the infection, not a primary mitochondrial disease, but a secondary deficiency. Um, and then certainly, you know, multiple side effects of medications, but Certainly within our practice, uh, in kids with multiple medications, we have seen some of the, the significant side effects, and it's something to keep in mind and uh, uh, know about. Um, Plaquenil is one we very rarely use, um, but uh, in kids with autoimmunity, severe joint pains, and particularly bands 31 and 39, it's something we may use with, with caution. So I, I think with Lyme, as with autism, as with all of these diseases, it's about putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, not just throwing antibiotics on, but looking at all of the other things. So I think I answered most of the questions I got in advance. Do we want to do questions now, or do we want to? I think for the panel. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>